way up. Oh, there we go. We've got some volume. Excellent. Um, welcome to the next talk this afternoon. Uh, a talk that I think um, has a foot in a few different tracks today. So here in the education track, but I'm sure this is probably of interest to people in the security track and also potentially at DjangoCon. So it's good to have uh, Zane and Kerry here, long-time lovers of Python security and recent lover of hot cross buns. Who's that? That's you. Yep, yep. Um, they're going to be telling to us about uh, using Python, Flask, and Docker to teach web pen testing. I'm going to hand over to them, and uh, I'll be back at the end. To, they, they do intend to take questions, so if you do, if anything comes up, you know, store it in your brain and, and, and ask that burning question at the end of the presentation. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cool. Um, so we are so sort of an introduction, I guess, first. Um, I'm Zen. I'm the one on your left. Uh, I do work sometimes. That's true. And I'm Kerry, and I hold dogs. There you go. That's yeah. as much as you need to know about us. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm Zane. That's Kerry. We um, ran a cybersecurity course at uh, UNSW. So, you know, we were pitching at university students and sort of trying to teach them about how to break various websites, different vulnerabilities that you could have. Um, and the core structure of this course was we had lectures and labs, war games, which is more or less just an assignment where we release a website and we tell the students, break it. And when you break it, tell us how you did it and you get marks, right? Um, and then we also had some exams, which were more or less on the same vein. It was a very practical course. Um, and we found that the most effective way of teaching security is hands-on practice. That's something we're very firm believers of. Um, so we really just wanted these students to hack all these sites and maybe fix some of the vulnerabilities. Um, and we thought that would be a good way to teach them how those sort of web works in the landscape. Um, the issue with that is that we created something along the lines of 65 websites over this course. Um, each of them independent with their own set of vulnerabilities. Uh, and that was hard. Um, like the team was not massive. We didn't have you know, like Atlassian in our backyard. So we kind of had a, sm a small team to manage 65 websites and get them all live and also maintain them, because these websites would be up for mo like more or less a semester. right? So it was very difficult. It would have been somewhat impossible without automation. So we used Docker and Flask and a lot of Python to sort of make this all somewhat automated. Yeah, and when you're teaching a security course with sites that are meant to break, students tend to break them in ways you don't expect as well. So like, we'd have sites just go offline because we forgot to um, turn off secrets of them, but, um, and then they, they drop the um, database and then things would break very badly. Yeah, it's a delicate balance to give them just enough power to break it a little bit, but not enough to completely take it down. Um, so yeah, so like within the first couple of weeks, we were overworked. <laughs> Um, and we kind of like were patching along this infrastructure as we were going on to try and like keep up. Um, and this presentation is going to be very sort of um, disjoint. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what we did and immediately what went wrong and then how we solved it. So we thought it would be more interesting if we just went through, here's what went wrong, here's how we fixed it and sort of dealt with it um, and sort of the lessons we learned along the way. Um, and I thought that might be quite interesting. Uh, so that's sort of the structure. And yeah, and thus we started building it, and we ended up with a somewhat <laughs> well-oiled machine pumping out sites. Cool. Somewhat. somewhat. Um, yeah, so we actually, we actually launched two sites for this, which, uh, which are basically challenges that we launched during, during the semester. Like, um, if any of you have laptops, you want to have, have a look at it, they're, they're like on those like, URLs. Uh, looking now, yeah. uh, if you guys don't, I don't see many laptops, so maybe this is a bit of a Yeah, so maybe this is a bit of a mute point, but it's there. If you're curious about what these sites look like, we kind of launched two of them just so you can take a look at them. Cool, okay, so let's talk about code. Um, first problem that we encountered very quickly is we had to write a lot of code, and we did not have a lot of time. So sort of the first thing we did um, was kind of come up with a tech stack. Yeah, so for our tech stack, um, well, it's my title, you can guess that we use Python, Flask, and Docker. So pretty much Python, Flask form the web applications. If, if we needed a database, we had Postgres, and everything was wrapped in Docker, and it was orchestrated in Docker Compose. Um, yeah. And that's the reason why we chose Python and Flask. So Flask is super, super simple. Like, um, I think I've, next slide, no, never mind. So, so pretty much, like, to use, to use Flask, like, the most basic web app you can take is, like, 10 lines, and, like, it's just super, sim super simple to, to get up and running, and Python comes with, like, a bunch of functionality built in to actually actually do stuff in, which makes it perfect. Um, we use Seek Alchemy to, um, to, to interactive databases, and it pretty much like, 
as far as we know, the only options for web apps are Python, Ruby, and um, PHP. PHP would have been a really good language to actually do this course in, but like, um, it's, yeah. well, PHP has the issue of we used it up in a previous running of this course, and it's kind of too insecure. We ran into the issue where, like, we would, like, try to open up a little bit of a vulnerability and then immediately give them full pseudo access, and it happened a lot. Um, so we kind of shifted to Python, so we had a little bit more control over what we were doing. Um, although, it's worth noting that PHP is kind of the quickest way to get a site up. Um, so we kind of had to do a little bit of a sacrifice there. But we found that Python was like a nice balance of quick and easy to set up, very easy to edit on the fly. If things break, you don't have to recompile or anything. Um, and also a nice balance of giving us some, of, like a little bit of control over what users are doing. Cool, so, so one of the first problems we encountered was that like, so for every site, we were just copying and pasting the, the same code. So we just take the um, last site we built, um, copy old sites to new sites, and then just change the names, titles, files, and whatever. Like, um, so, 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 so a really nice tool out there is our cookie cutter, in which you can basically, like it, it's a glorified copy paste with um, set inside. So pretty much you just you specify a template and you fill in like the variables you want. So in this case, we, we like, what we want to customize was the site name, database credentials, and what port we want to publish on. And it just um, gives us a, like a template for, for a new site super, super quickly and easily. Yeah, so you can see like in the drift there, we're like, yo, here's a new site, here's what it's gonna be called, does it have a login, what's the theme gonna be, you know, do, do we have a database, all that sort of stuff. And you just follow the CLI and then you're done. This site now is launchable, right? Um, so really important and kind of, it lets you do configuration files, Flask, boilerplate, basic HTML, Docker Compose, the entire annoying stack and all the files, you can just copy and paste the entire folder and you can use these little template strings and be like, yo, I want this folder to be whatever the user inputted under project slug, right? So it lets us copy, paste, and set and sort of set up a fresh environment to work in really quickly, uh, which is important because a lot of this stuff didn't change between the sites but was very annoying to set up each time. Yeah. Like, like it sounds pretty trivial, but like once you have this up, it makes life so much easier. Like now we have a problem like that. We can copy paste the sites like pretty easily with, with, with a glorified set. But say we had a flaw in like how we in our template. Say like we left open some port we shouldn't have, or we're listening on global rather than local host. And only then we realize there's like 30 sites in. It's it's I have like to update now. We have to go back to every one of these 30 sites and then like manually change that value. Or like well you said, but like also like that's not the most optimal way. Yeah. So deploying updates is a pain. Is the pain in the old way? Yeah. So yeah. like you know you need to edit something. You don't want to like check out every single one of these websites and fix them all individually. And also we were still copying and pasting large bits of code that realistically you want to be packaged away in its own system, right? Because a lot of the endpoints are going to be the same across all these sites. Um, all these sites are probably going to have some login endpoint, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So what we have is like a common package which which exposes a Flask like a Flask application. And on that application, we actually attach routes onto it. Um, so Flask is something we built, and we put it on pip. Um, so it's just like a pip installable package. It means that we can push updates to pip, and all of our sites will receive the updates on a relaunch, um, which is kind of a really easy way to push out updates. I'm also very shocked that we got Flask Core. I would have thought it would be taken by something else, right? But no, it's us. <laughs> yeah, so, like, um, so for people who haven't seen Flask before, how you use it is basically you import Flask, you create an application um, object, and you decorate a function and return a value from it. That's like the simplest um, app you can make. It's six lines. And like, so our idea was to take that creation of the app object and put it into a pip package, which we can update on the fly. So what our applications start like, or like basically this. So from Flask Call, we import our app and we create an instance of it. And pretty much all of our code lives in blueprints, which you can specify like so from, we have dot main import blueprint, patch it onto the core, and then all your routes are available on that um, Flask, Flask instance. So yeah, it's just like a fancy way or to kind of encapsulate um, our logic into like one object and call the Flask blueprint, and you can just chuck it onto the core. And you know, the core will update as need be, and your, your actual site-specific stuff is separate to that, and then it's a nice little, little capsule. So you can kind of separate your concerns a bit there. Um, and also, since we were writing this under time pressure uh, with uh, a lot of sites coming out of us, we had to update core quite often to fix out various little bugs. Um, so it's nice to be able to do that with like a couple lines of code instead of a million, right? Yeah. Uh, the next problem was students kept brute forcing our sites. 
Uh, this is a completely valid way to attack a website. Chuck as much as you can at it and see what happens. Um, there's some automated tools that will try every possible vulnerability exploit until they find one, which is great. Not if you're running your site on like a AWS nano box and you do not have the RAM nor the connection speed to keep up. Yeah, so like give context. Like, so some tools can achieve up to like a thousand requests per, per second. Now take that across a hundred students onto, that's gonna be like what, a thousand times a hundred per second onto a, onto a nano box. <laughs> Big. And that box falls down really quickly. Quite miraculously, yeah. Um, so <laughs> like we, we told our students, we were like, yo guys, we love you, please don't do this. Did that stop them? Of course it didn't. All of them still did it. So we, we, as a quick patch, we started setting up a middleware system so we could intercept requests and like, observe them. And if we thought a request was a brute force, we could quickly block it, right? Um, so how we did middleware is? Yes, cool. So, um, so pretty much how, how Python web apps work is that they talk through a protocol called WSGI, which, which lives between like, um, Apache or Nginx and Flask. So pretty much we, we have a um, shim in between there which we, which we have a handler, and we call our middleware on the request in that stage. And for our simple, um, simple middleware, we just check if the user agent has SQL map or Durbuster in it. And if it does, we just return a 503, um, and then we just, like, and, we, and hopefully the, the student stops when they realize that they can't get anything from it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's worth noting that we kind of had to make our own middleware system because we wanted it to be a little bit higher level than what generally middleware in Flask involves, which is at lower level, closer to yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of the WSGI stuff. So we built our own middleware network. This is maybe not the best way to do it, but I think it's fair to say that when you're teaching, you're not going by the best industry practices, funny enough. Um, a lot of the time, you're just trying to get something out to demonstrate a point, right? Um, so we kind of, we hacked this up, and we think it did our job quite well. So... It works, problem solved, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, yeah. So quickly, people realize that if they change the user agent, you get past that check really easily. And since our um, Flask, since Flask call is actually open source, they went to the source right away and saw that we're just checking the user agent, and they changed that to like Chrome. So what, what our next step was, was to force all students to actually off, off themselves against us. So we knew like, who was sending each request. And once we did that, People got really scared of trying to brute force our sites when we asked them not to. Yeah, um, I mean, it's worth noting that like, the sort of authentication layer that we put in was maybe the best thing we did, because not only did it let us do stuff like, yo, if you do something wrong, we know who you are. Um, it also allowed us to do stuff like, if a student came up and said, I, my report got deleted, my dog ate my laptop, um, I, I, can't, I can't prove to you that I was able to break the site, we could say, well, we have logs. We know that you did X, Y, Z, we know that you got this far. So we can kind of guess whether you got there or not, right? So it gave us a lot of power as well. And it also is really useful for exams, right? Um, it's nice to be able to tell what students are doing what and where. Um, and it kind of it gave us a lot of flexibility. And we'll talk about that in later slides. Yeah, so we use a, um, we use a piece of software called Keycloak, which is um, made by Apache. I'm not, not too sure. But essentially, the business spiel is that all we need to know is that you can create users in it, and you can actually tie it into Apache, right? So pretty, pretty much, uh, when every quest comes in, it comes in with a Keycloak token or, or a cookie, and Apache checks that against Keycloak through Open ID Connect, and if it's if, if it's valid, um, Apache actually adds on a remote user header, so we so we know who's um, we know where the request is coming from, and. And since Apache is checking for us, the, our Python doesn't really need to actually off anyone. It can trust the header. And students can't actually set that header um, because Apache will block it, I think. Hopefully, it yeah, did. it did. And yeah, and also, as a, as a side benefit, um, actually, I, so we had internal services running which would connect to our service, um, connect to our applications. And they could spoof as any user they wanted by just setting that header, which, is, which will come in useful later. Yeah, I think like it, there's a good argument to be made of why we didn't do this just in Python because Python has its own auth item networks. But we really wanted these to be very uh, like take take downable. There's a better word for that. Ephemeral. Sure, let's go with that. Um, I want like some of these sites would break spectacularly, but the like putting them on Docker means you can shut down the website and bring it back up, and it should work fine. The issue with having a consistent auth network meant that we would have to coordinate all of these different instances, all of our different websites, to use the same like auth network. 
you, can, you should be able to log in with the same credentials across all of them, right, if you're one student. Um, and we also want it to be able to track you across all those sites. So by having it on like the layer before Python, it kind of makes Python's job a lot easier and it just has to focus on making the site. So like a lot of us using Python to teach this course is to use other things other than Python, but I think that's worth mentioning that you know, Python's very good at what it does and trying to like keep it in that realm of where it's very powerful is probably the best way to handle it. Um, there are better tools for auth that runs on the server. They did it better than we could have done it in Python, right? So it's, it's like a nice idea to separate your concerns and sort of focus on what Python does best, which is I want to site up in two seconds, I can do that. Yeah. And we can't break off because we're not doing off yeah. ourselves. So yeah, uh, so the next problem we have is that students kept on interfering with each other. So what we mean by this was that, so say you have a site with like where you could register a new username and password. Some students would have this smart idea of registering an account called admin with a password of admin. And then other students would go in and try that account and see that it worked and thought that it was us. And then they would spend like multiple hours trying to chase, chase down like a bug in that, like in that account when it was really just account some, some guy just made. Yeah, and I mean, having a shared database between all the students was already bad. Some people would, like, maybe if we had a fake site which let you make Facebook posts, they would, like, post the answer and all the other students could see it, right? Um, so what we did was we isolated databases. Um, so this is sort of the code, but you don't really need to understand it. What happened is every single site and every single student within that site had a little isolated database that they worked with, and if they messed it up or they added fake accounts or whatever, that didn't interfere with any other students. Um, and immediately, like, uh, all of the complaints we got, like, dropped by, like, half. Because a lot of students were like, uh, I can't access the site anymore. Someone deleted the entire database, which happened several times. Um, yeah, we, yeah, that was not good. Yeah. So by doing this, if a student deletes the entire database, it's only their database. So all the other students can still break the site and sort of learn from it, right? Um, so if you're doing anything with databases and students and breaking, isolate the databases, because this is 100% going to happen. Um, uh, so problem six was students kept trolling each other with fake flags. Um, this came into the idea of like students would, again, on a Facebook post, like post a flag, which is how you can verify that you broke the site, right, is you find a flag that says you won. Um, so they would post something like this, and student, other students would get confused. They wouldn't actually, they'd like stop working on the site thinking that they've broken it, right? Um, so what we did was we used a very quick hash function, which took on a secret that we kept secret, uh, the student ID and like some flag ID and generated a random string and that was a student's flag. So this is unique to the student. Every student gets a different flag. They can't share them. Um, it's easily verifiable. If a student tells us what their student ID is, we can immediately check whether their flag is correct. Um, and it's also uh, very hard to guess. It is a random string. It's like a SHA-256 output. You can't, you're not going to guess that and be like, oh yeah, I broke it. C8, 38A84 off the top of my head. So the point is, is that you, like, these are impossible to guess. You have to find them, and you can't share them because they're student-specific. Cool. Um, and yeah, like, the files can be anywhere. The way we handled this was in an afterhook. This is something that runs after every single request um, in Flask. We would look for like, a flag ID, grab it, generate a flag for the current student who's visiting the site, and chuck it in there. So it kind of like took away all of the hassle of generating that on the fly. Yeah, but like, so with this approach, we have to be very careful as to, um, like, as to what the IDs were. Since if, like, so, uh, so a student could post like a flag ID, and if they guessed it, that would actually be transformed into an actual flag. So yeah. basically, it was a shortcut into finding the actual flag. So you know, these students are very smart, smarter than us sometimes. Um, so. Uh, Let's quickly go over XSS. Um, so this is a very specific example that I think may not make sense unless you don't understand how cross-site scripting works. But long story short, some of these vulnerabilities rely on some admin sitting on the computer, clicking on a link you know, from a Nigerian prince and being like, oh no, my details have been stolen. And that's really hard to automate. Like, I don't want to sit there clicking on all these links that students send me to trigger some like, payload. Um, but you can't automate that. You really need like, someone on a Chrome instance going and clicking. right? So there is something you can use called a headless Chrome, which opens up a full Chrome window. It has like it renders it and everything, um, and then you can like tell it to move mouse to this link and click on it to simulate what a user would do. It's very heavy. It takes up all of your RAM, as Chrome tends to do. Um, and if you run it on a thread, it will block the entire thread. So uh, a core thing that we do um, across all of our sites is we centralize things. 
So what we did with this is we had one Python service, and again, this is why Python is my favorite thing ever. I'm like, yo, I want to spin up multiple threads. Here's a pool, I, here's a queue of tasks, and that's all I have to do. Python will allocate the headless Chrome tasks to different threads, handle them, spin up new threads as it needs to do. I don't have to touch it, it's awesome. And then I, just, I also spun up a quick server and a literally two lines of code. And all that does is say, if any of these websites asks me to visit the site in a certain way, put it on a thread, let it happen. Right? So this is how, kind of how we handled teaching XSS and sort of automating that, um, which is something that before we came up with this was kind of impossible to do for us. Yeah, and like Chrome, like headless Chrome has a bunch of bugs, which is, <laughs> yeah. like we had a problem with like, so, like, like zombie threads. Like I think at one point we had like around 6,000 zombie threads because Chrome wasn't Reaping them properly? Yeah, so like w once you start Chrome, you do not get rid of Chrome, according to like how <laughs> this is how headless Chrome worked. Um, so it would like it would like eat up everything on the computer, um, which I think we fixed by just being like, yo, every day, just like restart. I think it's like every every half hour. Yeah, every half restart. hour, restart. And you know what? That worked, and that's okay. <laughs> um, so we're running. We're gonna run into question time. Oh, I think we are running into question time. So we may skip the. Oh, but, Oh, beautiful, never mind. We're gonna go through um, a little bit of how we did deployment now. So obviously, here's a, here's a hot tip. If you're gonna have a lot of websites, you don't need one server per website. You can, like Docker really makes it easy to run multiple on one machine. So we only ended up having two AWS boxes. Um, I think like one medium and one small or something. Um, and both of these sites ran all through all 63 plus of our sites. All we did was we said, internally, whenever someone visits, use a vhost to look up which container they're referencing and then forward the request to that container. Um, yeah? Yeah, uh, that's pretty much what you just did right here. Yeah, so like this diagram I like very much because I made it. Uh, so a student would say, I want to go to fun.ns.agency. We actually did buy the domain ns.agency, which is very cool. Um, so then we, so this goes through the DNS and all, everything that's .ns.agency will go to this one box, let's say. Um, this is more or less how we set it up. And the box then says, okay, this person typed in fund and NSO agency, they want to go to this website, this Docker container running on, on me, right? And Apache really quickly would be like, cool, there, move on with your life, right? So it's quite cool. So we had, you know, like 32 sites running, and each of them just had a different domain, and we would just tell Apache to redirect it as it comes in, yeah? Um, also quite convenient, because if something goes wrong, you don't need to look up which box you need to SSH into, it's just the same one. Right? So it gives you a little bit more control. This is obviously, this does have the issue of our, our redundancy of if one Docker container messes up and takes down the box, all of your sites are now down. Um, but also, we, we did not have the funds to run like one, like one site per server. Oh yeah, so another problem we had was that, so at the very start, every, every site had their own Postgres container. Um, at, at, at 60, 60 sites, whatever it was, having one Postgres instance per site eats up all the RAM. So, and that's not something we wanna do, and so essentially what we ended up doing was, was the same as it did, did with Headless Chrome. We have a centralized database with, uh, the, with a database for, for every single site. Um, yes, yeah, so like, and that, that basically frees up our RAM, but also has the downside of if somehow one one student from like one, one container manages to guess the super user credentials. So you now have the access to every database we have. So, but you know, just set a good password, that, that's fine. Um, yeah, so yeah, centralizing was a really good idea. And um, I do want to mention, we did try to do this in Python with some fancy tricks of like writing like a SQL statement on the fly with the student's credentials and appending and stuff. And it kind of, we reached the point where we were like, this is a solved problem. Like, Postgres has built-in features to isolate different databases on one instance. We're just gonna use that. Like, there is such a thing as over-engineering, and especially if you're in education, like, if you just want this site to be accessible, just lean on as much of external code as you can. I know that after all these years of computer science, I have a tendency to want to code everything myself just because I can. Um, so it was kind of, I think, carrier to convince me to be like, saying, just use SQL, stop coding up like a 500-line Python program to do this for you. Um, it would've been magical if that worked. I probably wouldn't have worked, let's be honest. <laughs> um, cool, and then I think this is uh, the, the last problem we're gonna talk about, right? Yeah, um, is we were generating too many logs. Obviously, each site was generating a log of what every student was doing, um, which is awesome. 
consolidating that's quite complicated, and it's something we did want to be able to do. Um, and again, it's a solved problem. We had every single Python log system go through Docker into an Elasticsearch instance, and we just said, yo, compile it by student, and we could easily look at what each student was doing. Uh, incredibly useful. Um, one, because it let us see kind of across the board what was happening if one site was down or like making a lot of errors. Um, and two, it was really cool because we could track students across multiple sites, right? And if one site had a million people hitting it and no one was getting the flag, maybe something was wrong with that site, right? It was really useful because like we did discover bugs this way, is where like no one's been able to figure out this one specific challenge, why not? And we look into it and it's because it's broken, right? Also, there's one time when Elasticsearch actually brought everything down because we filled up the, uh, our, our hard disk with logs. So you need to make sure your hard disk is big enough for logs. Did that happen? Oh, it did. Yikes. Cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, so like a student would visit a site, try a payload, get to a page, and find the flag, and we can track them at each point and on every single site, right? Um, which was incredibly powerful and useful. And I'd like to say we didn't. We didn't like do anything magical here. It was just log lines that we were passing rather than setting up like a full you know, metric system. Uh, cool, and I guess just final sort of reflections. Um, if, you're gonna be, if, you, if you're gonna be writing tests, have the tests do exactly what a student would do. What we did was we had our tests on the server running behind Apache. It meant that we didn't have to worry about auth. We could just quickly test the websites. Fine, except if the site is unhackable from behind Apache, there's no way you will know. Because your test is telling you, yeah, that's fine, and then, but no student is able to do it. Yeah, so like, so, like, Apache, that, uh, Apache has a thing where like, if we can normalize the URL, it will. To have slash dot dot slash, it means go, go back one directory. Apache will, um, will take that away, and I like, just turn it into a normal URL while our challenge was expecting a dot dot slash in the URL. So that, so that worked internally, but from the outside, Apache just normalized everything, and no one could get it. Yeah, so students were like, we can't get it. And I'm like, you're not trying hard enough. My test is passing, so it must be you. Um, I didn't actually say that. But no, yeah, so this was an issue. And like, looking back, definitely, like, if you're going to be writing testing for anything that a student's going to be accessing, mimic exactly what they're going to do. Um, no shortcuts. Cool. Um, so just on teaching, all of the infrastructure made it difficult to release code to students. An important part of learning how to write websites that aren't vulnerable is to learn how to fix them and how to like, prevent against common vulnerabilities. Um, and it's hard to do if you have mountains of infrastructure and Flask core and post hooks and pre hooks and all this sort of code. It made our lives easier in deploying them, but it made their lives harder on just sort of understanding the core of what we wanted to do. Um, I also want to quickly mention that Python is too secure. <laughs> Uh, does anyone know what XXE is? That's fine. So some, sometimes when you pass like XML, so you know, kind of like a HTTP-ish file, um, you can actually break out and start accessing files on the server. Um, and it's something we want to demonstrate. No library in Python lets you do it. You have to like download a really like dodgy one and like turn on a flag to actually make it work. Which make these, it makes it quite difficult to explain why this will happen in actual industry because Python by default will block most of these like vulnerabilities. Um, PHP does not, which is why it's quite good. Um, also Java. Java will let you do it as well. Yeah. Um, and sort of, like, there's a bunch of different things, but I guess the point is, is that, like, Python is used in industry as such. It comes built in with a lot of, like, security features. So you may have trouble with it every now and then. Um, so, yeah, it's just, like, a consideration. And I think, maybe just finally, running all of the infrastructure took so much time that we really didn't have a lot of time to, like, sit down, talk to students and say, how are you learning best? What do you think the course could be doing better? We tried our very best, but like, the team was overwhelmed by building all of these sites, which we thought would be the best way to learn. And I think if you're going to be running the course and you're gonna be having infrastructure that the course relies on, you need to delegate it away from two people. One or two people whose entire job is to just look at the tutorials, look at the labs and lectures, and just look at content itself and sort of teaching plans. Um, this seems obvious, but to us, we thought that a good set of practical challenges would kind of fill that gap, but it really doesn't. It's important to have someone who's non-technical just sitting there trying to understand like the human aspect of it. Yep. And yeah, we have question time. How long do we have? Like? Yes, we've got, we've got one minute, so we've got time for one question. If there's someone out there with a question. No. All right, looks like you might be off the hook. Guys. Cool. Um, thanks for that. Um,